out of our own interest. And we, as the crowd, we just please the leaders, we just please the motivators, those who say what we want to hear, and those who make us say what they want us to say. We're all characters that hunger for stability. Stability of status, of authority. We all want things being organized in a way that we can oversee it. And we think, like them, it's all under control. It's all under control. Still, I'm confused. We have two men called Jesus. One says he's the son of God, but he doesn't say anything at the moment. And the other one is called Jesus Barabbas, son of the father. And every one of us can smell that he's a criminal. But who cares at this minute? Because at the moment it's about safeguarding our future. It's about safeguarding our level of independence. And so I switch off from what I believe. And instead I am happy to please the crowd. And somehow I hope that this this gentleman will forgive me as I stand up for my own security. So let's follow each other, let's join in and say crucify him. Because what can we do? Is it really our responsibility that people are suffering in silence? Is it our responsibility that people down the road live below the poverty line? Is it my own responsibility that polar bears start eating each other? And even so, it's impossible for me to prevent that this man will be crucified. Nothing, nothing I can do. Crucify him. I'm standing in a crowd and I feel all alone. And why on earth does he not speak up? Why does he not speak out? Why does he not show that he is more powerful than those who think they can rule us? Those who think they can teach us, using the law to bend it all for their own good. Why does he not show a different path? If he could only show to me that path of integrity, of innocence, of blamelessness, That silent Jesus. And we all know that he is pure, that he is not guilty. By saying that he is guilty, I, I feel I cover my own shame and I start feeling not myself again, I start feeling that I am dead within. All I can care for at the moment is, is keeping everyone happy around me. The governor, governor, the teacher, and you next to me in the crowd. And I better hide myself. My opinions don't count anyway. So I, I cover 
myself and I follow my fear, the fear of becoming someone, someone like him who's standing above it all. I wouldn't dare to be him. This silent Jesus. And you know what? I somehow sense that he is in full knowledge of what is going on. He chooses silence. In fact, he is pulling the strings. He stands above them all, the leaders, the teachers, us, the crowd. Gradually, I feel I can sink into that, that steadfast silence of his. Because something is written on his face that there is a deeper truth in him. That there is a name in his person that everyone can know. That everyone can be drawn to. Almost as if heaven and earth can find a new path in him. Narrow as it is. Will I be able to, to leave the crowd? Will I be able to become myself? Not longer Ido, but Kerst Ido Sikama. I was given a name by birth, Kerst Ido Sikama. Kerst of Christ, Christian. Can I bear that name? of Christ can I carry it inside going a narrow path that I somehow find in this silent man will I dare to stand up to rise above these voices in my head and these voices around me Will I be able to follow a different path that leads to salvation, that leads to healing, that leads to innocence? Will I be of Christ, Christian, cursed? God, give me strength. God, give me courage to stand and to keep standing. Even when I feel trapped, when I feel stuck in the crowd, why don't we stuck together, stick together in this moment? Not as these people, not, not knowing what they want, but God's people, as they were standing there once, God's own people standing there in front of a great sea, not finding a path in there. And behind them, Pharaoh's army, a huge and evil threat. And they felt trapped. But let's stick together now as God's people, God's own people. Knowing that we are secure in him who says... That right now, he will fight for us. And we can be silent. He will fight for us. And we can be silent. on his head. They clothed him in a purple robe, 
and went up to him again and again, saying, Hail, King of the Jews. And they slapped him in the face. Once more Pilate came out and said to the Jews, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no basis for a charge against him. When Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, Pilate said to them, Here is the man. As soon as the chief priests and their officials saw him, they shouted, Crucify! Crucify! But Pilate answered, You take him and crucify him. As for me, I find no basis for a charge against him. The Jews insisted, we have a law, and according to that law, he must die, because he claimed to be the Son of God. When Pilate heard this, he was even more afraid, and he went back inside the palace. Where do you come from? he asked Jesus. But Jesus gave no answer. Do you refuse to speak to me? Pilate said. Don't you realize I have power either to free you or to crucify you? And Jesus answered, You would have no power over me if it were not given to you from above. Therefore, the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to set Jesus free, but the Jews kept shouting, If you let this man go, you are no friend of Caesar. Anyone who claims to be a king opposes Caesar. When Pilate heard this, he brought Jesus out and sat down on the judge's seat at a place known as the stone pavement, which is Aramaic, Gabbatha. It was the day of preparation of the Passover. It was about noon. Here is your king, Pilate said to the Jews. But they shouted, take him away, take him away, crucify him. Shall I crucify your king? Pilate asked, We have no king but Caesar, the chief priests answered. Finally, Pilate handed him over to them to be crucified. The word of the Lord. Santiago, Guatemala is a small town on a beautiful lake called Atitlan. It was created out of a volcano, and there's volcanoes around the entire perimeter, all named after the disciples. It's one of the most stunning landscapes in the world that I've ever seen. But it's also a place of bloodshed and hatred and war. And there was an American Catholic priest who went to live among the Guatemalan people. And he loved the people, and he loved the poor. And these were peasants. But the government determined that these were not just peasants, they were communists. And they decided that these people were going to rise up against them. And so they decided to try and stop that. And so one night they came and they killed Father Rother in his bedroom. And a few weeks back, I was standing in his bedroom, and there's still blood stains on the wall and on the floor from where he died. And he died because he stood for his faith, and he stood for the flock of people that God gave him to care for. He is one man. But today we're talking about another man, Pontius Pilate. He was one of four men who were given the role of judging Jesus. He had authority 
He was the governor of Judea. What was Jesus accused of when he stood before these leaders? What, what did they say about him? They said he was an evildoer. They said he was misleading the nation and forbidding to pay taxes to Caesar. They said he was stirring up the people through his teaching and inciting the people toward rebellion. They said he was proclaiming to be a king and he was saying he was the son of God. In this day and age, those crimes probably wouldn't even appear before a court except for maybe the tax part. But in that day and age, these were big charges. For the Jews, saying that you were the son of God was blasphemy, and according to the Levitical law, you could be stoned to death. For the Romans, for someone to say that they were a king, went against Caesar himself. So these were big concerns. Interesting enough, the Jews turned their back on one of their own. Jesus was a Jew in the lineage of King David, but they turned their back and went to the Romans. The Romans were the oppressors, they were the conquerors. It was the biggest, most powerful empire. And yet, at that moment, the Jews turned to the Romans. Why? Why would they go to these people who just a few years back, when a census was called, for people to be able to register in order for the Romans to tax them, that they revolted and there was bloodshed because they were angry at the Romans. And yet on this day, at this time, they turned to the Romans for help. They did it because Roman law trumped the Jewish law. The Jews were not allowed to kill anyone but the Romans were. So the Jews took the side of the Romans on that day, changed all of history. But if you look at just Pilate, he was a really interesting leader because he was a man that was caught. He stood on the fence a lot of the time and he made some pretty big mistakes. There's two that are recorded prior to when Jesus came into his presence. One was that um, when he you know, came into power in, in Judea, he had his soldiers come in, and at the top of the standards that the soldiers would carry when they would march in, he had the face of Caesar. And for the Jewish people, this was blasphemy, because if Caesar's face was up there, that would make him a god. And for the Jewish people, their god was God himself, God Almighty. And so there was an uproar. But Pilate did not back down. A little while later, he created another huge blunder with the Jewish people. He took money from the treasury of the temple to build an aqueduct. The people were in an uproar, and this time blood was shed, and people died. So Pilate did not know the Jewish people. He did not understand who they were and what they needed and what they valued. But Pilate knew that Jesus wasn't guilty. He spoke it out three times publicly. And he did many things to try and stop it. Here's a few. He tried to pass on the responsibility to somebody else. Send him to Herod. Herod's the Tetrarch. He has more power. He's, in, he's under Galilee, which is you know, his jurisdiction. That's where Jesus came from. Let's let Herod deal with it. But Jesus refused to talk to Herod, and Herod said, this man's not guilty, and sent him back to Pilate. Pilate thought, okay, I can release him. I can release him. But the people wanted Barabbas. He tried to find a compromise. He scourged him and beat him and put him back out there near death. But that wasn't enough. The people wanted him in an actual deadly state. He appealed to their hearts. Shall we crucify your king? That didn't work. And he appealed to Jesus himself. You do not speak with me. 
Pilate said, do you not know that I have authority to release and I have authority to crucify you? But in spite of all this, the people remained obstinate. Pilate remained confused. In the midst of all of this, Jesus' compassion came through. For he spoke to Pilate words that I think Pilate needed to hear that day. Because again, he was a man of power that was extremely confused. And Jesus said to him, You would have no authority over me unless it had been given you from above. For this reason, he who delivered me up to you has the greatest sin. Pilate faced a decision. He had a choice. Just like we all have a choice. But you know the legacy that Pilate chose? He chose to go down in history as a murderer. That was his choice. This cross um, is a treasure of mine. It, was, it is the exact duplicate of a cross that hung on Sister Silvia Ariola, a Salvadorian nun who was a nurse and worked among the poor in um, Mexico and then in El Salvador. And um, she was a lady of the people. She lived in the slums. She loved the poor. And she especially loved the youth. She was passionate. She was fiery. And she wanted to serve the Lord with all her heart. And like Guatemala, El Salvador was in a severe civil war. And the poor, the peasants, were standing against the side of the government yet again. And... In 1981, about six months before Father Rother was murdered in Guatemala, um, the government came in heavy to the town where Sister Silvia was and where these communities of faith had just been exploding among the youth. And the soldiers came in, and Sister Silvia fled with 91 other people. The soldiers tracked them for three days, and they caught up with them and murdered all of them. This is the same group of people who fathered Oscar Romero, who was murdered as he gave the Eucharist to his people. And they were buried in mass graves. The reason I have this cross is because I have a brother in Christ named Jose, who was a youth of 15 years old and was in Bible study and under the discipleship of Sister Sylvia. And she made this cross and gave it to him. And because I'm his sister in Christ, and I'm his godmother, <laughs> um, he gave it to me. And why it is such a treasure to me, it's one of the most treasured things I own, is because it's a daily reminder to me that I have a choice, and you have a choice. We can be like Sister Sylvia and Father Rother and Christ himself and stand up for what we believe, even when our family, our friends, people around us don't understand or condemn our ways. Or we can choose to be like Pilate and write our legacy in a different way. But I think what I've realized is that the choice isn't just once. The choice for us is daily. Luke chapter 23, beginning at verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the Skull, they crucified him there, along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. And they divided up his clothes 
by casting lots. The people stood watching and the rulers even sneered at him. They said he saved others, let him save himself if he is the God's Messiah, the chosen one. The soldiers also came up and mocked him. They offered him wine vinegar and said, if you are the king of the Jews, save yourself. There was a written notice above him which read, this is the king of the Jews. One of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. But the other criminal rebuked him. Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence? We are punished justly, for we are getting what our sins deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. Then he said, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. It was no accident that Jesus was crucified with these two men. Pilate knew what he was doing. He knew exactly what he was doing when he placed Jesus in the middle of these two men who'd also been sentenced to death. Who were they? What was their crime? What had they done which merited the punishment of crucifixion? What had they done which meant that they deserved this slow, painful death by torture on a Roman cross? Luke describes them as criminals, in Greek, kakurgoi, evildoers, malefactors, men who've done bad stuff. Matthew and Mark use a different word, maybe more exactly describing what they'd done wrong. In Greek, it's lestai. It means rebels or bandits. An earlier era of Bible translators unhappily rendered this word as thieves, with the result that generations of English speakers have imagined that Jesus was crucified between two men who were guilty of nothing more than maybe some minor shoplifting or picking pockets or stealing food. But no. These two men are rebels. They're bandits. They're insurrectionists. Maybe some people today might call them freedom fighters. Maybe others might call them terrorists. These men are most likely passionate, they're committed, they're zealous. These men most likely loved God's people, Israel. These men most likely loved God's house, his temple. These men most likely loved God's word, the scriptures we call the Old Testament. And it was no doubt because of this maybe misguided love, because of this passion that these men had joined up with some small group of rebels, had made the same decision that many before them had made and that many after them would make. The decision that armed uprising was the way that God's people would be set free. So they had decided to become freedom fighters for the people of God. They decided heroically to take on the might of the Roman Empire. They had chosen to bravely stand up to the power of the emperor. They decided fearlessly that they would do whatever was necessary to throw off the oppressive yoke of the Roman superpower in the certain knowledge that God was with them. A lifetime of resistance. A lifetime of fighting. 
a lifetime of ends justifying means, a lifetime of rebellion. And this, this was where it ended. This was where it ended, on a Roman cross. And what was there to show for that lifetime of fight and struggle and opposition? The Romans were still in charge. The pagans still ruled over God's chosen people. The symbols of imperial power were still everywhere, everywhere. They were on the coins that they used to buy and sell, the military banners that were everywhere throughout Judea. The symbols of imperial power were in the place names of the towns dedicated to the god emperors. And of course here, on the execution hill outside Jerusalem, the ultimate symbol of imperial power, the power to take life. These two nameless men crucified with Jesus were a sign to everyone who saw. A sign that this was the penalty for rebellion. Death. Death. So it was no accident that Pilate had Jesus crucified with these two men. Pilate places Jesus, the king of the rebellious Jews, in the middle of these two failed rebels. Pilate announces to the world that Jesus is a king. He puts a, a sign, he writes a sign and nails it above his head on the cross and he kind of gives Jesus as courtiers as his royal entourage, these two rebels, these two rebels whose lives of rebellion are now shown to be futile, whose lives seem to be wasted, whose hopes are empty, whose rebellion has failed. Verse 39, one of the criminals who hung there hurled insults at him. Aren't you the Messiah? Save yourself and us. I have a lot of sympathy with this man. I am, after all, a failed rebel. It's the human condition right now, fallen, rebellious, hopeless. As a failed rebel, I've learned how to criticize those in power. As a failed rebel, I've learned how to spot the mistakes and the shortcomings of the guys in charge. As a failed rebel, I've learned how to challenge every authority. As a failed rebel, I've learned how to tell them what they ought to be doing. Aren't you supposed to be the Messiah? Why aren't you saving us? Look, you're not even saving yourself. As a failed rebel, I'm nailed up to the consequences of my small, ill-judged rebellion. And it's hard not to be angry in the face of that much failure. It's hard not to shout insults when there is so much pain to draw on. If I was the Messiah, I would do things very differently. If I was the Messiah, things would get sorted around here. That's what rebels tell themselves. That's what we tell ourselves. That's what I tell myself. Paul describes it like this. He writes, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. Malice and envy and hate. This is where failed rebellion leads us, but it doesn't have to end there. It doesn't have to stop in the furious anger that we couldn't have it our way. It doesn't have to stop in the furious rage that we couldn't make the world work the way that we wanted that we couldn't be in charge. Verse 40, the other criminal rebuked him. 
Don't you fear God, he said, since you are under the same sentence. We are punished justly for we're getting what our deeds deserve. But this man has done nothing wrong. We are getting what our deeds deserve. This man who's saying this, this man has lived his life rebelling against Rome. He's lived his life fighting against the pagans. He's lived his life sure that God was with him in that. He's lived his life certain that God would vindicate this battle. And now, on this Roman cross, nailed up and bleeding, he sees that God is acting in what is happening to him. He is a failed rebel. And he's nailed up next to the king of failed rebels. Jesus, king of failed rebels, remember me. Put me right. Be the king I so desperately need. Those words of Paul again. At one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of our Saviour appeared, he saved us. Not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. Foolish, disobedient Deceived, full of malice, full of envy, full of hate. And Jesus answered him, Truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. And we can speak, we can pray as failed rebels with that failed rebel on the cross. King Jesus, I surrender. I reject the anger and the hate and the foolishness of my rebellion. And I choose instead to trust you. Lord, I want to be with you today. I want to know the paradise of life with you. I want to know you next to me, speaking to me, assuring me that your king, holding out the blessings of your kingdom. King Jesus, remember me now and when you come in glory. Mark 15 verses 33 to 41. The death of Jesus. At noon, darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon. And at three in the afternoon, Jesus cried out in a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which means, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? When some of those standing near heard this, they said, listen, he's calling Elijah. Someone ran, filled a sponge with wine vinegar, put it on a staff and offered it to Jesus to drink. Now leave him alone. Let's see if Elijah comes to take him down, he said. With a loud cry, Jesus breathed his last the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. And when the centurion who stood there in front of Jesus saw how he died, he said, Surely this man was the son of God. Some women were watching from a distance. Among them were Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James the Younger, and of Joseph and Salome. In Galilee, these women had followed him and cared for his needs. Many other women 
who had come up with him to Jerusalem, were also there. This passage begins with the advent of darkness. My dictionary defines darkness as the absence of light. Light illuminates, with light we see, light gives hope, the light at the end of the tunnel. Therefore, darkness represents hopelessness, but does it? The darkness in the passage lasts from noon until 3 p.m., which is why we meet between these hours on Good Friday to meditate on the death of Christ. According to Luke, the darkness was caused by an eclipse. However, we know that Jesus was killed around the Passover, and the Passover was at the time of the full moon, so it is astronomically impossible to have had an eclipse at that time. What was going on? The darkness was a divine sign, a miracle. What did the darkness represent? These three hours of darkness eerily mirrors the three days of darkness in the ninth plague, which occurred just before the Passover, the first Passover. In Exodus 11, the firstborn of the Egyptians were taken and those of the Israelites were spared because of the blood of the lamb on their doorstep post. And in Exodus 12, verse 12 to 13, God explains his actions and I read, and um, substitute Egypt here for anything that enslaves or holds one captive. On the same night, I will pass through Egypt and strike down every firstborn of both people and animals, and I will bring judgment on all the gods of Egypt. I am the Lord. The blood will be a sign for you on the houses where you are, and when I see the blood, I will pass over you. No destructive plague will touch you when I strike Egypt." A terrible darkness that lasted three days before a terrible divine judgment and a great redemption. After three hours of darkness and Jesus' sixth hour on the cross, he cried out, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But was God absent? I believe that nowhere is the Trinity more present and more active than at the crucifixion. God is fully present in his son's sufferings for our sins. God is fully present in the loss of the grieving women who stood afar off. God is fully present in the centurion who declared Surely this man was the son of God. God is fully present when Jesus cries, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? God is fully present when his son dies. God is fully present when his son descends into hell. God is fully present in the darkness. The darkness is not the end of the story, thank God. In many ways, it is the beginning of a new story for humanity, for you and for me. In the darkness and death of the crucifixion, our story of life and hope begins. In Genesis 1 verse 2, sometime after creation, we see that the earth is full of chaos, darkness and is formless and the spirit of God hovers over the face of the deep and God says let there be light the recreation of the cosmos begins in the darkness 
and the chaos. And with the action of the Trinity, the Father who creates, the Son who is the Word who speaks, the Spirit who hovers and empowers, light, life and goodness came into being from darkness. A mysterious paradox. At the baptism of Jesus earlier in Mark 1, we see another prefiguration of the paradoxical mystery of the cross. In the baptism, as at the crucifixion, our Trinitarian God is again fully present. Jesus steps out of the waters into the darkness of our world. The Holy Spirit, in the form of a dove, descends upon him. And the Father roars from heaven, This is my Son, in whom I delight. The centurion at the cross echoes the words of God by saying, surely this man was the son of God. What an odd thing to say. Jesus was dying, had just died on a cross, the lowest, most demeaning way the Romans killed criminals. They crucified those whom they considered to be the lowest of the low non-Roman, base, nasty, naughty criminals. Surely this man was the son of God. What an odd thing to say. Just after Jesus had cried, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me and died? Surely this man was the son of God. The centurion chose to recognize Jesus kingship. Unlike the soldiers who mocked him and demeaned him, he chose to see God's full presence in the misery, death and darkness of the cross. We still see these responses today. Those who choose to see God fully present in our broken dark and suffering world, and those who choose to believe that God is absent, powerless, or does not exist because of the same darkness and chaos. We know that God was fully present at his son's crucifixion, which took place for our sake, for our brokenness, for our sufferings, and for our darkness. We know that God is fully present with us today in our brokenness. We choose to know. God is fully present in our sufferings. God is fully present and active in our misery. God is fully present and active in our hidden shame. God is fully present and active in our darkness. The God who through his son's sufferings and by the Holy Spirit transforms death and darkness into light, life and goodness is fully present with us and in us today. The readings from Luke chapter 23. Verse 44 on page 1001. Luke 23, verse 44. It was now about noon, and darkness came over the whole land until three in the afternoon, for the sun stopped shining. And the curtain of the temple was torn in two, Jesus called out with a loud voice, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. When he had said this, he breathed his last. The centurion, seeing what had happened, praised God and said, Surely this was a righteous man. When all the people who had gathered to witness this sight saw what took place, they beat their breasts and went away. But all those who knew him, including the women who had followed him from Galilee, stood at a distance watching these things.
I recently heard about a man called Michael. And he was one of these people who was relentlessly positive in everything that he said and did. If someone said, how are you doing? He would say in response, if I were any better, I would be twins. That was his kind of attitude to life. And uh, he was always encouraging other people, always looking for opportunities to build people up. When people were down, he would kind of strengthen them and, and so on. And someone asked him, how come you are always positive? How do you do it? Surely you can't be like this all the time. And he said, each morning I wake up and I say to myself, you have two choices today. You can choose to be in a good mood, number one, or number two, you can choose to be in a bad mood. I choose to be in a good mood. That's what he would say. Each time something bad happens, I can choose to be a victim or I can choose to learn from it. I choose to learn from it. Every time someone comes to me complaining, I can choose to accept their complaining or I can point out the positive side of life. I choose the positive side of life. The person asking him these questions said, surely, you know, it's not that easy. And Michael said, yes, it is. Life is all about choices. When you cut away all the junk, every situation is a choice. You choose how you react to situations. You choose how people affect your mood. You choose to be in a good mood or a bad mood. The bottom line, it's your choice how you live your life. Jesus chose. Firstly, he chose to come to us. God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son that whoever believes in him might not perish but have eternal life. In Philippians, Paul wrote, Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped. Rather, he made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. Jesus chose to come to us with an attitude of a servant. To serve his Father in heaven and to serve us, the people in this world. Why did he choose that attitude? Because he loves us. He says, into your hands... Father, I commit my spirit. He chose to come to us. He chose to die for us. Again in Philippians, being found in appearance as a human being, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. To humble himself and become obedient to death meant being cut off from God the closest relationship one could ever have Jesus chose to be cut off from that relationship by taking on the sins of the whole world on his own shoulders taking our sins on his shoulders sin cuts us off from God Jesus' attitude in that choice was humility. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to death. Why did he choose that attitude? Because he loves us. Into your hands. I commit my spirit. Jesus chose to enable us to choose him. 
he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on a cross. That attitude is sacrifice. We see sacrifice in loving relationships, in husbands and wives, when they sacrifice their own desires in preference to the other person. We see that in um, the way a mother looks after a child, putting everything else to one side to care for that child, the same with the father. We see it models when we love our neighbours as ourselves. We actually put ourselves to one side and we say, I'm going to love my neighbour. That sacrificial love is multiplied many, many times in Jesus' attitude. Why did he choose that attitude? Because he loves us. And so he leaves us a choice to follow him. Jesus said, take up your cross and follow me. So that man, Michael, several years later, he was involved in an accident where he fell 60 feet from a communications tower. And um, he, uh, his body was completely broken. He had 18 hours of surgery and he ended up with um, kind of metal rods in his back. And there were weeks of intensive care. And he got released from hospital. Um, and about six months after that accident, the same person who was talking to him before about how he managed to be so positive um, talked to him again. And he said to him, how are you? And he said, if I were any better, I'd be twins. Have a look at my scars. And the person declined from seeing the scars. And he said, what went through your mind when that accident took place? And Michael said this, the first thing that went through my mind was the well-being of my soon-to-be-born daughter. Then as I lay on the ground, I remembered that I had two choices. I could choose to live or I could choose to die. I chose to live. Were you scared? Did you lose consciousness? Michael continued, the paramedics were fantastic. They kept telling me I was going to be fine. But when they wheeled me into the ER and I saw the expressions of the faces of the doctors and nurses, I got really scared. In their eyes, I read, he's a dead man. He said, I knew I needed to take action. And the person saying, asked him, said, what did you do? And he said, well, there was this big burly nurse shouting questions at me. She asked if I was allergic to anything. Yes, I said. He took a deep breath and they waited for a reply. He said, gravity. And over their laughter, he told them, I am choosing to live. Operate on me as if I am alive, not dead. And Michael lived. We have a choice to follow Jesus, to choose life. Paul and Philippians said, in your relationships with one another, have the same attitude of mind Christ Jesus had. Our attitude should be like-mindedness. To serve our Father in heaven. To serve one another to be humble in the way we think um, about other people and how we behave towards them. To be a living sacrifice, 
putting other needs before our own. When we live like this, it's truly liberating. It is life as God intended it to be. It is life in all its fullness. Why should we have this attitude? Because it's our response to his love.